those of you who don't remember, when I um, gave this talk, or well, the first part of this talk, I got together with Dad and Brian to show them some of the, uh, the material that I had. It became clear very quickly that there was too much to fit in one day. And uh, we finished rather poignantly on the uh, Kaveya Massacre, which happened just before Anzac Day, in fact was the 20th anniversary of that massacre, the day that I was giving the talk here. All right, so if we're ready to go. So a bit of a quick recap, if you were here, or even if you, if, sorry, if you weren't here, but even if you were. This is the first year of my life in the Air Force. <laughs> Culminating in the 7th, 747 ever made, transporting us to Rwanda. So just in case I was, but here are the highlights. So I went to Three Rath Hospital, which is uh, one of the two major Air Force hospitals. This one located um, in Western Sydney, Richmond. From there down to Point Cook to do my officer training. And then I did AvMed, which included this fabulous course, which is a week flying with the roulettes. Well. <laughs> Want to see that again? Yeah. Yeah. So I was at that time flying with squadron leader Glenn Coy, who was roulette leader, um, and uh, he was my instructor, and I was able to log the hours, which was fabulous. All right, then um, back to Richmond to do operational health support and training, which is essentially how to fly medivacs, how to plan, how to fly, how to keep patients safe, how to prepare them, and then transport them, and then deliver them uh, as as well as they had uh, been when they came onto the aircraft, or better. And at that point, we'd not had a death in the air, in the Air Force, in all of the medivacs that we'd flown up to that point. And I don't know what the stats are subsequently, but it, but it was a fairly big burden at the time to know that we'd not had, not lost a patient in the air, even with Vietnam. And then, of course, uh, my attachment to the second Australian medical support so, um, uh, Greg to the second United Nations assistance mission in Rwanda. And we left from Townsville eventually, after the, the um, crew at Townsville US the aircraft for 24 hours because they didn't like the look of it. Right. And what you can hear, uh, this photograph was taken from the balcony of the barracks that we're staying at. And that's a recording that I took with the birds. From the previous uh, presentation, there was a little bit of difficulty getting, I didn't have the audio for you, but what's coming up shortly is the audio from, um, in the mornings, we hear the, uh, the Rwandan army out on a recruiting call, singing and chanting. reality, just a quick reminder of where Rwanda is. It's a francophone country, hence the map all being in French. And we were in the uh, capital of Kigali, which as you can see is in the centre of the map, just here. And we were staying here in the barracks and there was a quick walk out the gate, around the corner and then into the hospital compound here. All right, so where we left off was in Cabello, as you recall, it was a refugee camp, which was in a territory that the Zambian battalion was responsible for at the time, and that there'd been a forced closure um, for various political reasons. The, the, the local army had uh, decided to close the refugee camp to uh, stop it from harboring uh, war criminals who had been responsible for the genocide. And we had uh, a small group of um, Australians, about 20 in the medical company with uh, uh, infantry support who had gone out to the area. So they consisted of a, a doctor, a nurse, some uh, uh, just routine trained medics plus some SAS medics, 
um, and a small group of infantry soldiers. And this closure had occurred. They, they effectively could tell it was coming and had done everything they could to talk it down. And when people started to stampede and run, the local army opened fire. And the, of course, the Australians were stuck in the centre under the UN rules of engagement, not permitted to fire back, only permitted to care for people that they could reach. And there were several stories of really significant heroism involved in trying to, to rescue um, people around them. And for 24 hours, they were effectively under fire before we were able to um, extract them. Now, none of the Australians who was there was physically injured, but most of them have very significant psychological scars from what occurred. And as luck would have it, there was actually a war photographer with them at the time, George Giddos, which is why we have so, much, so many images. That was what, when I eventually got out to Kibaya, which was eight days later, there was a central compound of what had been a convent school. So this is the quadrangle of the school. And the last couple of thousand people were trapped in here with no sanitation, no food, no water. And they were being um, starved out by the, the army. And held back by fear and threats. And it was truly revolting. And of course, all anyone wanted was food. And then we reached the point where we had no blankets, we had nothing to care for people, and you, that child was wrapped in a yellow contaminated waste bag just to provide some, some shelter for him. This is a child who, this is one of the medical slides, of course, which I used to teach when I get the opportunity. And there are little spots on this child, the, the rash, which at the time we thought might represent typhoid. This is a couple of uh, one of our sorry one of our nurses and one of our medics attempting to change a nappy, <laughs> <laughs> and people would wander up to us. We were uh, about maybe a hundred metres or so away from that compound, with a mass grave between us and the compound. And people would wander up, would be brought up to us, or the soldiers would go in and collect the sickest looking people and bring them out to us, and we'd set up drips and we would treat what we could with antibiotics, with fluids, with dressings. And we'd feed them. Now this, this is a, an example of um, what I think is a great irony, which is the French make fantastic food, but they are the worst ration packs in the world. And we were more than happy to hand off French ration packs to anyone who was starving. <laughs> Now this lady here, there's a photograph of her in the, um, the Australian War Memorial. If you uh, go into the entrance, there is an installation along the right-hand wall as you walk into the War Memorial in Canberra, which has a photograph taken at every conflict that Australians have been involved in since photography existed. And at the very end, which was, this was the most recent conflict when that installation was put in, uh, there's a picture of uh, then Corporal Jenkins dressing this lady she has barbed wire cuts on her head, which have been festering for a week. So that was a very sobering experience. I was out at Cabello for, I think, about eight days before I got gastro and me back to myself back. <laughs> It happened to coincide with um, the big wigs from the UN deciding they were going to fly in for the day and come and have a look at the good work we were doing and bring the press. And, um, and I, um, <clears throat> I told the boss that he was riding back in, it was the day we were due to leave anyway, and I told him he was riding back for two and a half hours in the four-wheel drive and I was taking the aircraft and then had myself admitted to the hospital at the other end. And I don't remember much of the next 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, that... Um, this photograph was actually taken just before I went to Cabello. This is Anzac Day. This is the um, Anzac Day parade that we undertook. And of course, being three, two or three days after the massacre itself had tremendous poignancy. But of course, then it was business as usual. Now, did anybody watch the SAS show Corporal George? 
was it Trooper George? No, Sergeant George? I can't remember. The, anyway, when he was Trooper George Tullerley, he worked with these other two guys uh, as my medics in the, um, in the RAP. And we were basically functioning as the, the GP service to the UN in Kigali. And they're not sitting there rolling bandages. That's what they look like. But, um, nonetheless, it, you know, we actually had a, a, a really good level of camaraderie. Uh, Corporal Nicolik, Corporal Boyle. So um, Nico was just a, a general medic um, attached to the to the hospital. He was uh, at Wanfield Hospital, and then uh, Dominic Boyle was uh, an SAS medic at the time. That's Corporal Jenkins, whom I mentioned a moment ago. He's just putting in a, a drip line for uh, a young man who I can't even recall what he needed. Of course, I was having great fun feeding children, teaching little African kids to eat Vegemite. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we were functioning, this is a gentleman who's in our intensive care unit, um, and at the time he was suffering from tetanus, which was a relatively common condition. And we were able to treat him and keep him alive, and he made a full recovery. And, of course, one of the things that, that um, sort of we could set our watch by is not... Not the change in temperature, because the, change, the temperature in, in Rwanda when we were there was a constant 25 degrees, day and night. Because it's, it's right on the equator, but at about 7,000 feet altitude. And so the only way you could tell the seasons are whether it was dry, big wet, or little wet. So big wet was when it rained twice a day, and the little wet was when it rained once a day, and you could set your watch by it. And it's one of the reasons why the main industries at, at the time in Rwanda, the, um, the main sort of mainstay behind their economy prior to the genocide is tea and coffee, because it's so easy to, to harvest at, uh, under those conditions. But when it rained, it rained. Now, in order to operate a hospital, you need to have interpreters because we would have multiple language, uh, languages represented amongst the patients. Sometimes we were fortunate and people spoke English, but a lot of the UN soldiers who were there were chosen because they were from Francophone nations. Now, the Canadians were typically bilingual, but those from Mali and Senegal would primarily speak French and occasionally could speak English. Now, I don't even remember from last time I told you that the, the language there is Kinarawanda, which you speak as the home language. Once you go to school, you learn French. If you proceed, uh, sorry, at secondary school you speak French. If you proceed to a tertiary education, that's performed in English. Now these are our main interpreters. This is Gregoire, uh, Providence. Um, who else have we got? This is Anisi. Um, and I've just gone blank on, uh, on this lady. I'll, I'll remember it shortly. Anyway, so these, uh, these these four in particular, I worked alongside a lot, and um, they would uh, just have a roster, and they lived at the ho at the hospital, and would turn up whenever we needed them. And of course, we spent a lot of time looking after injured children. It could be something simple like a good old supracondylar fracture, which is something that a lot of children get just anywhere in the world, or children who stepped on landmines or this child who had been struck by a bullet which had actually hit his hand first and then deflected into his eye. But the, um, the energy was spent enough that it only took the eye and didn't actually cause any form of brain damage or anything else. And we spent a lot of time doing, again, I don't know if you spend any time in hospitals, but if you go into a hospital and you've got a child with you, one of the first things you do is grab a balloon Sorry, grab a glove and blow it up as a balloon. And that's Paul Jordan, who's an SAS medic. In there, teaching the kids just, you know, how to play in the back of an ambulance. It's Connie Scott, who's one of the nursing staff for uh, RAP nurses from um, then Darwin. Uh, and this was then squadron leader Tracy Smart. Now, uh, I'm actually not sure whether she's group captain or whether she's an vice marshal. She's the highest ranking um, doctor in the Air Force at present. Oh, that's me. Which one? 
I'm the, I'm the kid. Oh, the spirit of these kids was wonderful. So this, uh, I'll, I'll introduce you to some of them in a little more detail. That's Paul Jordan with Uma Hosa. And she was an angelic child, just beautiful. Unless something upset her. In which case she would go from that to that. <laughs> and she had a set of lungs on her that you could hear for kilometres. Fortunately, Mel worked out how to take care of her. So Mel's one of the uh, uh, Air Force nurses who just went, look, hey, this is how these kids are brought up. I'm going to wrap her up on my back and she probably went to sleep. And this is little Ua Maria. You've seen a couple of pictures of her just a moment ago. She, we estimate, was around eight years old when she came in. What you can see here on her ankle is a blister. In fact, there are blisters on the skin here. She had a temperature of about 40, 41 degrees. Severe pain and what turned out to be something that we see here as much as you see anywhere else, which was just out of control, golden staph infection. And in her case, it was deep down into the bone of her ankle, but it in fact spread right through her. When she was brought in, as an eight-year-old, she asked through the interpreters, please, just let me die. And for an eight-year-old to have a concept of death was itself very sobering. And at the time, we were lucky enough to have a, a physician who was an ex-British uh, ex Army um, uh, officer who had originally trained as a cardiologist and then had retrained as a tropical medicine specialist and then he moved to Australia and he joined the Army Reserve in Australia. And he was at the time the director of the intensive care unit at, uh, at the uh, Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane where I subsequently did my training. And, uh, and with that background he essentially looked at every drug that we had and worked out how he could combine them and he combined six different medications to try and have her pull through. She would have to go to the operating theatre to have dressings changed because it was so painful. This is uh, Captain Norman Gray. He's an intensive, uh, sorry, uh, an emergency department physician. And if you are unfortunate enough to be dragged into the emergency department at Fiona Stanley Hospital, you may see him. By unfortunate, I mean unfortunate for you that you're injured and have to go to emergency. Um, but yeah, so Norman worked at Fremantle and I believe he's at Fiona Stanley now. Uh, this is George Donalek, who, um, another flight lieutenant doctor, who uh, I then worked with subsequently in Townsville, still lives there. Uh, and this gentleman here is one of the medics whose name I unfortunately can't remember. And so she would have the dressings taken down under anaesthetic and everything cleaned out and then the dressings redone and on occasion a plaster placed on it so that she prevent movement. And eventually it got down to healing, just a bit of ulceration in the middle. And this is scar tissue, but she's essentially healing. And she was so used to the dressings by then she'd help us out. And that photo was taken the day that the day before she went home. But she was with us for months. In fact she had a birthday while she was with us. She was a beautiful child. This is her with the, um, the two engineers who built, who constructed the crutches for her. And then one day her sister turned up to take her home. She jumped on her sister's back. We didn't see her again. And she'd been with us for four and a half months. And then Borregaea, another very poignant story. This is a, a little boy, we think around 10 or 11, and he was in the refugee camp in Kabea. And he was shot on both sides of his chest. And he was rescued and hauled out of there by uh, uh, a couple of the, um, or by the SAS medics and by uh, one of the nurses, Robbie Lucas, I'll show you the photograph in a moment. And 
rather heroically resuscitated on the way up to Cabello, um, brought in in extremis. This is him in intensive care. But within a couple of days after they had operated and removed the shrapnel from around his heart and reinflated his lungs, he, uh, he was sitting up and colouring in. <laughs> so there's Paul Jordan, who was one of the guys who helped bring him out. And so that's him with oh, Maria and with Jacko. And that's him with Robbie. Now, Robbie tried very hard to actually work out some way of adopting this child and bringing him back to Australia, and there was no adoption agreement and no mechanism for him to do it. And that's the last day I saw him, which was uh, at the orphanage mm. that he went to live at once we moved. So we, we actually call this orphanage the Mother Teresa Orphanage. I'm not sure that that's actually its name. I'm not sure what name it went by, but the, um, the nuns who ran it were Indian nuns from the, uh, the order, same order as Mother Teresa. And the medical company had essentially taken on this orphanage as one of our you know, charities, one of the things that we could do while we were there. And so for the last five weeks that I was in Rwanda, I was the medical officer attached to the orphanage which meant that every morning I got to go out to the orphanage, see whichever sick kids the nuns decided needed to be reviewed, look at some medications or dressings or whatever else, and then I got to play with the kids for the rest of the day. And that was the most uplifting thing for me, after what I'd seen there, to spend five weeks playing with kids. And there were a lot of times where there'd be children whom we'd looked after in the hospital earlier on, we were there and they'd recognise me and they'd come over and I remember one stage I was talking to a bunch of kids, I was doing some origami, making an origami elephant that my mother had taught me to make when I was little and, and as I finished and I handed it out I looked down and this little girl had sidled up to me and climbed onto my lap. She was a girl that we'd looked after earlier on in her stay who was miserable. The whole time that we had her in the hospital she cried and yet we treated, what well, she was in with tuberculosis, we treated the TB, she got better, she went back to the orphanage. And to look at this happy, smiling girl was one thing, but she'd also grown about four inches. Mm -hmm. Having had the infection treated, her body was able to then convert food to little girl. And, uh, and she'd, <laughs> she'd, she'd grown, and she just sidled up to me and gave me, climbed up my lap and just cuddled in. <laughs> So the orphanage actually had quite a lot of, of land and it also um, served as a nursing home, if you like. There were a lot of um, elderly people who were elderly residents there as well. And the local workers, of course, were tasked with teaching the children to read and write. So this is them sounding out um, the different phonemes for that follow on from the letter S. Of course, they were much more interested in the, in the honky white girl taking the photograph and not their lessons. And on the last day that we went out there, they put on a concert for us. And these kids would be sleep, sleeping three and four to a cot, but they're all happy. Now, this is uh, Wing Commander Louis Irving. He's a, a chest physician, a respiratory physician from Melbourne. And he was one of the multitude of specialists who were transferred over for periods of six weeks at a time to come and support us, um, to support the more junior doctors who were there the full time. And he's holding, uh, Louis Irving, he's holding baby Louise. Baby Louise was left on the doorstep of the orphanage that morning as we, when we went out there. We think probably she was a rape baby, but we don't know. So she was left at the orphanage, and the, um, the nuns needed to give her a name. And there was Louis, and there was me. And um, Robin is not a very easy name for people in Rwanda to say. And so they chose Louise instead. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Now, at the time we were there, there was only one type of um, foreign source of income 
for Rwanda at the time we were there, and that was tours to see the gorillas, which I was lucky enough to do. This silverback, I took those photos, he would have been maybe this far away from me, so perhaps uh, four, five, six metres from me. And no, I didn't get any closer. <laughs> So, okay, so here come some more of the pictures for the people in the audience who like flying. So this is the sort of thing we would see when we flew in and out of, um, uh, of Nairobi, which was the, the sort of first stop destination before going anywhere else. And there was a, a UN C-130 that we would be transported on. Did I mention last time when, we, when the first contingent got there, they were being transported in and out on an Antonov with a Russian pilot whose briefing consisted of, we crash, you die. <laughs> and then he would turn around, close the door and get up to the cockpit and off they would go. Um, by the time we were there, we actually had a different pilot. This shows you some of the topography. So almost every inch of the land has been cultivated. It's all hills and there's virtually no forest at all. It's all there, there are a few areas to the north that I remember. And this is typically what you'd see as you flew in. I do remember doing one medivac to go and rescue, um, pick up some wounded Australians. We had a, a motor vehicle rollover. And it was actually one of my medics who was the most seriously injured. And we took two helicopters in to go and get them. Cloud cover was just below the tops of the hills. So the pilots were navigating down the valleys to try and get us, and, and following fairly outdated maps, to try and get us to the site of the, um, the crash. And it was pretty hairy at the time. But yes, I managed to talk my way into the cockpit. <laughs> so John Wilkinson is the, uh, the pilot of the, um, the C-130. There he is with his trademark cigarette in hand. Again, trademark cigarette in hand. Mm -hmm. And about, I think it was three or four years later, that same aircraft was shot down in, in Angola and he was killed. And a week later, his son went in to search for his body and was also shot down and killed. And there were some tremendous ironies. This is in Rungari. Those of you who don't speak French, it's the Court of Appeal in Rungari. Justice rendered in the name of the people. And that's the inside back wall. Yeah, bullet holes. And we would pass this sign travelling from the airport to the hospital. And then, of course, we got to go home. So it took us about five or six days of concerted effort to pack everything up into shipping containers and, uh, and duffel bags and to divide it up into what was going to be shipped home and what was going to be uh, sent home on the equally elderly 747 that they had chartered to come and get us. We, we did campaign very hard for Qantas to come and pick us up, but the response from the UN was, we only want to charter the aircraft, not purchase it. <laughs> so this is us at the Kigali airport just before leaving. So then it was back to real life. So things got decidedly more tame after that. Either that or I forgot to take my camera. Um, nonetheless, so I was then posted back to Townsville, where I then spent the next 14 months. And this was probably the most significant event to occur, which is the 1996 Black Hawk crash. Claimed the life of Trooper John Church. And the other person who was in that crash that I knew was uh, Corporal Dominic Boyle, who I showed you smiling in my RAP earlier. But that's probably the most iconic photograph of John, and that was taken by George Giddos. And then for my final year in the Air Force, I did a full-time four years. I was then uh, posted to Amberley, just to the west of Brisbane. And that was a deliberate choice. I campaigned for that because um, Dr. Henderson, whom I mentioned earlier, who trained, uh, actually, I, I think I might have got the wrong way around. I think he was in tropical medicine intensive care and then went on to do cardiology. Um, but he, as I said, was the head of the intensive care unit, PA in Brisbane. And I, by that stage, had decided that I wanted to train as a kidney specialist and uh, as a very, very well-regarded unit in Brisbane. And so he essentially put in a good word for me and I was able to get a job 
there and uh, undertake the next part of my career. But the prelude to that was spending the year in Amberley, during which I did one uh, significant deployment away, that was to Company 1 Squadron to um, Malaysia, with the intention of uh, flying lots of um, sorties in the FA-18s. So of course we flew up there in the 7-0, and were accompanied by our FA-18s who were doing this on the other side of the aircraft. So we were just told, sit down and don't move. <laughs> and then all of the aircraft would sort of station themselves out on the right wing and then come up for a drink on the left and then carry on off to Malaysia. Unfortunately, when we were up there, the, uh, it was just as it is now, there were so many forest fires that we got, I think, four flying days out of about 30. And no, I didn't get to ride in the uh, FA-18s because nobody got to fly up there. And then this was the, the sort of final hurrah. We had a, a, an exercise called Tandem Thrust that was a, a, a US-Australian uh, military exercise that involved about 25,000 Marines being staged through Amberley and then up towards Shoalwater Bay. And um, having that many people and that many aircraft moving through, we thought we'd better run a... Um, uh, a tabletop exercise for how we would handle an airfield emergency. And so I sat down with uh, the US Navy doctors and the medics and our own nurses and medics and uh, we sat down and I ran a, a, an exercise in which I came up with a fictional um, emergency based off uh, an, uh, uh, something that had happened up in the Cocos Islands a, a number of years before where a P3 managed to blow up an engine. And uh, so it shot off an engine and one of the propeller blades actually came through the fuselage and uh, killed one of the occupants of the aircraft. Um, and so essentially that was, that was the scenario that I ran. And then the next day, this happened. This is one of the US aircraft and it was uh, winding up for uh, its takeoff roll and its engine blew up. <laughs> Fortunately, it just scattered over a wide area didn't actually manage to, um, to pierce the, air, uh, the, the fuselage of the aircraft and um, all six or eight occupants managed to get off and were brought into it. And it was like a, a clockwork. We knew exactly what we had to do. All the paperwork was done. All the people were triaged and, and deemed to be fine and sent off in the, the appropriate direction. All of the, the boxes were ticked and they could not believe how I had predicted this. And do you think I could believe this? <laughs> And then I left the Air Force. So I discharged from the Air Force at the um, end of 97, beginning of 98, and went back off to City Street.